Okay, so we've gone through our stages of development and we've emerged out at puberty in what should be the genital stage. Um, but sometimes we develop fixations along the way. Fixations occur when um, whatever the impulses are for a particular stage, if those impulses get overindulged or they get underindulged, you can end up leaving some of your psychic energy behind. Some of your libido and or, th or some of your thanatos can get left behind at that earlier stage. And what that means is that as you get older, you'll, you'll be displaying as an adult behaviors that were appropriate, appropriate to that earlier stage. So that's what we call a fixation. Okay, so let's go back through the stages and all this stuff is exactly the same, but now I've put different pictures to illustrate what fixated behavior would look like. So during the oral stage, the, um, the behavior that was most common was sucking, biting, chewing, right? These kind of, anything having to do with your mouth. Well, it, as an adult, we can tell that you might have left some psychic energy behind in the oral stage if you smoke, overeat, chew gum all the time, talk a lot, drink alcohol, anything like that would be an indicator that you have left some psychic energy behind at an earlier stage of development, the oral stage. Now you'll notice also I labeled this the period of dependence. If you're fixated at the oral stage, we might see you displaying as an adult behaviors that are not the independent behaviors that an adult should be displaying. So for example, you get into a car accident as an adult and instead of immediately just calling your insurance agency and taking care of it, the first thing you do is call your parents. And you know, an adult should be able to take care of business without take, calling their parents. Um, if, you, if you display that kind of dependence, then Freud would say, well, your mom and dad must have over or underindulged your need to suck or bite or chew when you were in the oral stage. So maybe you were still sucking on your pacifier or drinking out of a bottle well past 18 months. Or maybe you were deprived of those things well before 18 months. This is where you start to look at it and say, how are parents supposed to figure out the right time to wean their, their, their baby? If you do it too early, you can end up with a fixation. And if you do it too late, you can end up with a fixation. Um, that's kind of the trap that Freud set for us as parents. <laughs> it's sort of guaranteed messed up. Um, I've got a little example for us of the oral stage. The guy's sucking on a binky and he says, I know I don't look cool, but it's the only thing that helped me stop smoking. So he took one oral fixation and substituted it for another. Um, neither one of them are all that socially appropriate, right? And we really don't, um, our society really doesn't approve of smoking anymore and I'm pretty sure it doesn't approve of um, binky sucking for being <laughs> for adults. Uh, so. How about the anal stage? Okay, now this is an interesting one because this is one where if your needs are underindulged, you end up with one kind of personality type. If your needs are overindulged, you end up with a different type. So remember, we're concerned with bowel and bladder elimination, so this is going to have really, um, the timing is going to surround um, potty training. If parents are too rigid in their potty training, so they're attempting to potty train their child well be before 18 months, uh, Freud would say that they are being too rigid and will lead to what's called an anal retentive personality type. When I was a young person, anybody who was super neat and orderly, very rigid in their schedules, always prompt, even a little early, stuff like that, we always called them anal retentive. Today I hear people calling each other OCD if they display those same behaviors. Um, anal retentive, I, one of the things I like about it is you can blame it on your parents. Well, obviously I was too rigidly potty trained and so that's why I'm so rigid in my behaviors now. <laughs> um, so that's the beautiful thing. But yeah, so an anal retentive person is somebody who's very, very um, orderly. On the other side is a child whose parents were too lax in their potty training. So well past 36 months, they still are having, um, the parents are still haphazard in their potty training and that child hasn't really learned um, to use the toilet reliably, right? Freud says that that's going to uh, manifest itself in a lack of control in adulthood. And so you get what, you're going to love this title, what we call an anal expulsive personality type. I mean, how much more specific can we get than to call it anal expulsive? 
So a person with an anal expulsive personality type is a person who um, is basically just generally lacking self-control. So you've got their, the messiness, the um, tardiness, the unrestrained eating and or drinking. You know, pretty much anything that you, nor you, you would normally be able to maybe exert a little bit of self-control and say, well, you know, I'd like to do that, but I don't want to. Um, I, I'd like to do that, but I can't because it would be wrong. I'm going to display self-control. Um, the anal expulsive person doesn't have that self-control. It's part of the development of the ego to have that kind of self-control. Um, so anal expulsive is, <laughs> so I've got a picture of an anal retentive guy cutting his grass with a uh, toenail clippers, or whatever those little cuticle clippers are, um, as opposed to an anal expulsive personality, he'd be like, well, I will just harvest my grass seed once a year, you know, and not really worry about it. I mean, what's the difference? You know, I have no self-control. So here's another cartoon. I was toilet trained a month early, and it's been downhill ever since. Um, I'm not sure that the fine line is one month <laughs> between anal retentive and anal expulsive, um, you know, the timing of potty training. But definitely, you know, if you are way before 18 months, which you might think, how far? Well, at the turn of the 1900s, there was a book that came out that taught parents how to potty train their infants at, by the age of three months. I think we could all agree that's probably too rigid to think that you're going to potty train an infant at three months of age. Clearly, they were not training the infant. They were training the mom to realize when the baby tended to, to wet and move their bowels and she just made sure to put them over the little bedpan in time. Um, I think we could all agree that's too rigid. By the time I had children, which uh, my daughter is currently coming up on 22 years old, um, I got a comment from my next door neighbor when my daughter was nine months old that her son was potty trained when he was nine months old. And I said, how do you potty train someone who can't walk yet? And she goes, oh, well, you figure out when he goes or she goes. and you make sure she's sitting on the potty at those times. And it's like, well, that doesn't sound very productive at all. You know, I'm working on a PhD here. <laughs> I don't have time for this kind of sit around the potty thing. And so, of course, she thought my daughter would end up anal expulsive, right, because I was too lax in my potty training. Um, my mom actually had a 12-month cutoff. She really thought my daughter should be potty trained by 12 months. And I didn't achieve either of those women's goals for my daughter's potty training. But I don't think it's a month off like this cartoon implies. It's it's well before 18 months. You're probably looking at anal retentive propensities, according to Freud, well beyond 36 months. You're looking at um, anal expulsive propensities. Okay, what about the phallic stage? Got a nice picture of a guy who's really involved in making sure that his body looks masculine, right? I don't want anybody confused here. I have a male body. This is my male body. Right Now, that's the thing about the phallic stage. According to Freud, now this is where um, let's all take a moment to say how much we love Freud because um, he thought that everybody viewed male as the desirable thing to be. And so whether you're male or you're female, if you get fixated at the phallic stage, you'll spend your time trying to convince everyone around you that you're male and how male you are, how masculine you are. So this stage is all about gender identity. And if you end up identifying with um, a male figure, regardless of your sex, if you end up identifying with a male figure, you're going to spend your life fixated on trying to prove to everybody how male you are. Now, it does manifest itself in different ways, whether you are actually male or you are actually female, according to Freud. For males, it'll manifest itself in things like, you know, building up big muscles, having um, a series of sexual conquests, you know, lots of notches on your bedpost, um, getting into fights, driving a big car or a big truck, um, you know, these kinds of, you know, hyper-masculine, look-at-me kinds of I'm male behaviors. He'd say that that was because you're trying to make sure that everybody knows you're male. For females, it looks a little bit different. Females, he called it penis envy, and he said that females will do things that normally men should be doing, um, like getting jobs. Oh. <laughs> they expect their opinion to be held in equal weight with men's opinions. Oh my gosh, it's horrible, isn't it? Um, 
Let's see what other things. Uh, they henpeck men. Don't you love the term henpeck? Um, so they nag. They it's, it, try and control verbally. Um, so you have men doing things, because they already are male, according to him, they do hyper-male things. For females, they do things that are just more typically male things that m females shouldn't be doing, according to him. Okay, so I'm trying to be nice and objective as I present his um, perspective, but I have to tell you a, a teeny tiny gossipy thing, which is um, he, de he developed his concept of penis envy after he developed uh, cancer of his throat and soft palate. And so the doctors had to remove all the cancerous tissue. And so when he spoke, some of the air would come out of his nose as well as out of his mouth. So he no longer could give speeches. And he had been, you know, for the past 30 to 50 years, you know, just running all over the world giving speeches on his innovative thoughts and stuff like that. And so, um, when he couldn't give his speeches anymore, the, the universities and places that had been hiring him said, well, maybe your daughter Anna could give the speeches, because now Anna was a psychiatrist of her own right. So Anna started going and giving her dad's speeches in his place. And during the time that Anna was getting all this notoriety is when he coined the term penis envy. <laughs> and it just seems a little convenient and um, a little coincidental that he thought she might be in the bow, you know in the in the throes of penis envy just at the time when he was feeling emasculated emasculated he lost his power here's a nice phallic cartoon dang i hate to sell it that rig has made me feel more like a man than any woman ever did uh, nice penis truck i like to call those big trucks my husband has one he hates it when i call it that <laughs> He's got his penis truck. Now, during the latent stage, a lot of uh, two out of the three classes that I took on Freudian psychology portrayed it like uh, you can't get fixated at the phallic, at the latent stage because there's no body part that you're attaching your psyche to. But uh, the third class I thought made a much better case for what Freud said, and it corresponded to my interpretation of what he said also. So I, I liked it better. Um, if you get fixated at the latent stage, you get overly involved in social demands academic demands if you're still in school or staying in school for a really long time, right? Um, or work demands. It may transition from I'm obsessed with my academic success and transition into becoming a workaholic at work, right? Rather than what you should be doing, according to Freud, which is finding a mate and making some babies. Now here's an example. Since I've been neutered, I have a lot more platonic friends than I used to have. See, he's not pursuing reproduction anymore. And so suddenly he's interested in friendship and social things. Um, one of the things about the latent stage is if you get fixated there, you may not move into that phase where you feel the need to do the next thing, which Freud thought was the healthy next thing to do, which is find a mate, get married, and reproduce. Now, of course, we're all supposed to be fixated here. In a healthy individual, we would all arrive in the genital stage with all of our psychic energy in place. But more than likely, as I was going through these phases, these stages and talking about fixations, you're probably like, oh yeah, I do that. At least once, probably more than once. I apparently was potty trained, let's see, I was weaned too early or too late, potty trained too, um, too early, because I have definitely got an anal retentive personality. And then obviously, I'm fixated at the phallic stage, because as you can tell, I have a job. <laughs> <laughs> and so the one place where I seem not to have gotten fixated is latent because I did get married while I was in college. So it's like I was doing kind of simultaneously academic and genital stuff. And that's one of the things about the genital phase is that the reason why you need all your psychic energy with you is because there are varied demands on adults. We have got demands on us to be sometimes dependent, sometimes independent. You know, you're in a group and sometimes you have to give yourself over and let somebody be an authority and you have to let them do it. And other times you have to then go home that same day and tell the people who are dependent on you what to do, right? And then, uh, you know, anal stage, we, we need to be able to display adequate self-control to do the things that we need to be doing and, and being responsible for. But then also we need to be able to suspend that self-control sometimes so we can let off steam and relax and, you know, um, rejuvenate ourselves. And then during the, the phallic stage, of course, we, we do every day have um, 
pressures on us to consider and reconsider what it means to be our gender, right? What our gender identity is and how, whether we're fulfilling what we what our image of that is. Um, and then, of course, we always have social demands, uh, maintaining our friendships and, you know, success at, at work or school or whatever we're doing. We have multiple demands as well as the normal genital demands of finding a mate and making offspring. So the reason why he thinks it's really important that we all make it into the genital stage with all of our psychic energy intact is that adults have a lot of things that they have to be able to juggle. And if we have fixations, it just makes it a little harder. Obviously, it's not impossible because more than likely most of us are fixated somewhere, which is where we start to realize that, you know, everybody is, probably has something that was unsatisfactory about their upbringing that, according in Freud's theory, probably makes it harder for us to cope. Okay. Now, Freud thought that um, we that there are things that happen to us in our environment that are anxiety inducing. Things like being given a, a due date on an assignment that you may not be able to um, meet and you start to feel anxious about, you know, not being able to meet the, the deadline, stuff like that. When you start to feel anxious, um, you might start to view yourself in too clear of light and your unconscious may not be able to you know, um, convince you to think otherwise about yourself. So Freud says that you have a bunch of different defense mechanisms to prevent your ego from having to know the full truth about your unconscious motives. So I've got um, a little flow chart here that shows us that, you know, you have unacceptable wishes and impulses. I've got a nice picture off of a um, you know, romance novel to, <laughs> to illustrate. It might be sexual. It doesn't have to be sexual. It could be aggressive. You know, you feel like, oh, my boss or my teacher is just, oh, I could just go over there and strangle them. And you're, that's an unacceptable wish or impulse, right? The fact that you have these unacceptable wishes or impulses can generate anxiety in you. And then to prevent yourself from having to face that anxiety, you may invoke a defense mechanism. That what you're defending is your ego from the truth about your own motives. So let me go through some really popular ones. Freud has like 39 defense mechanisms. If you're interested in this stuff, take personality theory. Um, but I will just give you the, the brief kind of high point ones. Regression. Regression is when you display behaviors that are appropriate to an earlier age. So here you have a five-year-old who's, you know, been weaned for a long time, hasn't sucked their thumb in a really long time, but they're anxious on the first day of school, and so they re regress to thumb sucking behavior. My sister-in-law went on to dialysis when she was like 22 years old because her kidneys were failing. And she told me that she would sit in the dialysis chair sucking her thumb. And she goes, I don't even remember that I ever sucked my thumb when I was little. But my mom, you know, came and visited and said, yeah, you know, this was something I used to do when I was a toddler. And she said, it made me feel better. You know, regression, sometimes we want to regress back to that earlier stage when we felt comfortable and protected and safe. A reaction formation is when you try and change your natural reaction to something. You formate, you formulate a new reaction to try and deny that you ever had the inappropriate reaction. So maybe you were really angry at somebody and so your unconscious formulates this really friendly persona that you're going to project so that nobody will pick up that in fact you're actually very angry at the person that you're um, that you're confronting right now and you're like, hey, how you guys been? What are you doing? And you're like, oh, this person owes me money. And But you, okay, I'm not going to be angry. I'm going to be happy. And this is all at the unconscious level. You don't know that this little battle happened under your water level. Projection. This is when you believe something and you don't like that you believe it, so you pretend like somebody else believes it. So I, let's say I'm a cheater. Let's say I've been cheating on my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Um, but I don't want to admit that about myself. So instead, I treat my boyfriend or girlfriend as if they're the one who's been cheating. I start getting all suspicious. I start rifling through their belongings. I start checking their phone. When in fact, I'm the one who's done something wrong, but I'm projecting that guilt onto them and pretending like they're the guilty one. Projection. Rationalization. This is when you convince yourself that your behavior just makes good sense right? Like the alcoholic who only drinks to be sociable. Hey man, everybody else was drinking. You know, what are you talking about? I don't have a problem. I only drink in social settings. That's Homer on The Simpsons. Um, Marge was giving him an alcoholic test and she says, you know, do you ever drink alone? And he says, does the Lord count as a person? 
that's a rationalization, right? He's like, well, I'm never really alone, right? <laughs> so, no, I don't drink alone. Displacement. You're angry, so you come home. You're angry at a target. Let's say your boss. You're angry at a target who you don't feel safe expressing that anger towards, so you bring it home and displace it on somebody weaker. You come home and kick the dog. Um, that kind of displacement, you throw an object is a good example of a displacement. That kind of displacement allows you to get your frustration out on a safer target, one that you know can't reject you or that can't get hurt. Like if you throw an object, you're like, well, it's an inanimate object, so who cares? If I punch a pillow or something like that, it won't really matter. Um, that's displacement. So you're taking your, and it's not always angry, it's your strong emotion. So it could be lust. Like if we look at the romance novel cover, women who read romance novels tend to have more active sex lives. One theory on that is that they take what they've generated by reading the book and displace it onto their romantic partner. <laughs> and the romantic partner is the beneficiary. Beneficiary? Denial. Denial is when you refuse to see the truth. So instead of um, my projection above where I'm mistrusting my boyfriend or girlfriend when I'm really the cheater, in denial, my boyfriend or girlfriend really is cheating. But I'm like completely blinders on, not willing to accept it. I absolutely deny what you are claiming to be true. I don't want to hear it. Don't want to believe it. Um, so these are just like the six most popular ones. Uh, like I said, Freud has 39. I, I mentioned one in the Oedipus conflict. The identification is another um, way to reduce anxiety. So instead of feeling bad about the fact that I wanted to murder my mom so that I could have my dad for myself, I identify with my mom and that identification process reduces my feelings of anxiety. I mean, he had a lot of these things. Okay, well, let's go ahead and stop here, and then we'll talk, come back in the next segment and talk about other theories that really came up as a response to Freud's theory.